This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, a transfusion medicine pathologist and assistant professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. Robert Fazio, assistant professor of radiology and division chair of breast imaging at Mayo Clinic here in Rochester, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Fazio. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Kreuter. This is uh, this is fantastic. I've never been part of one of these before, and so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Oh, we're grateful for your time. I think, you know, I, I kind of um, this topic came up because I remember fondly when I was in training and learning about kind of doing some breast needle diagnosis and such, like just remembering how important the conversation was with our radiologists. And so maybe if we could kick things off, I'm kind of curious from your perspective as a radiologist and really a division chair of breast imaging, why is it important, do you think, for a pathologist to understand a few fundamentals of breast imaging? Well, sure. No, I think that's a that's a great question. Really, kind of an open ended question to get started. Um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. You know, after after we talk through this a little bit. But um, you know, I think I think that pathologists really who understand the basics of our imaging really might be able to arrive at their diagnoses faster and and with more confidence. You know, particularly um, if the cases are challenging. Um, I think that um, both clinical and imaging information really about certain cases can be useful uh, to narrow a differential diagnosis or even provide a more confident diagnosis. Um, you know, you and I are really both in the fields of, of turning shades of gray into black and white answers, you know, for our clinical colleagues. And I think imaging knowledge really can can help you um, make those diagnoses and 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 make that challenge happen. Um, I think you know ultimately um, our pathologist understanding of of imaging fundamentals can aid in kind of the confidence of reporting um, uh, and also aid in concordance reporting, which is essential for for treatment planning, particularly in cancer cases. Wow. You know, that really resonates with me um, because of exactly, I, I think about the, the what's the adage, the the pot calling the kettle black. Sometimes pathologists, we kind of, you know, put, you know, great information in our comments and sometimes our, our colleagues uh, don't exactly read our, our comments, just look at the, uh, what we call the above the line diagnosis. And, and we're sort of like, oh, didn't you read our, our report? And I imagine the same thing is, is true in, in radiology. And so it's probably, yeah, that impetus for having a little bit of fundamental knowledge probably goes a long way. Or sometimes we talk about when is it important to pick up the phone and call? Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I really, I really actually enjoy reading the comments. Um, I, I know that when I see an extra comment, you know, below the, the diagnosis, the official diagnosis, I know that, you know, that's a case that, that maybe isn't as straightforward. And you guys are thinking about, you know, thinking out of the box and doing some different things to make sure that your diagnosis is correct. You know, and if I might ask, where where along in in your uh, you know training and development did you kind of come to that kind of realization of of kind of the comments and and the role that it's playing in the path report? Sure, I I suspect probably in my fellowship is mm -hmm. when when that sort of hit me a little bit. Um, I think in residency, you know, you're all just you're just trying to get through the rotations and do your best to you know to to pass the courses and 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 pass your exams and in fellowship you know you really start becoming part of the team i think and you contribute and you provide those contributions and so you know that's where i kind of learned that that some of these comments might be even more important than the actual above comment diagnosis mm, wow i think that's so important you know thinking about our audience physicians laboratory professionals and students is kind of goes to what you're saying, this kind of interprofessionalism, understanding uh, what others on the team are are doing and how they're contributing. Maybe we can dive into that a little bit. You can kind of, you know, I'm curious, what are a few aspects of breast imaging that, you know, pathologists, it'd be, it'd be really helpful for them to appreciate? Oh, sure, sure. Um, you know, I, I think 
I think there are a few things that are useful. Um, I, I think I think it can be helpful for pathologists to understand sort of the imaging impression of what we sample, and as this I think can help narrow the differential in challenging cases. Um, I, I think it's useful for you guys to know if we're sampling, uh, say, a mass lesion or calcifications or architectural distortion or whatnot, you know, because each of these things have um, rather unique imaging features and it can steer you down the right pathway um, mm -hmm. when, when you're having challenges as well. Um, I think it's useful for you guys to know our level of suspicion um, and also which modality we're using uh, for our imaging guidance. And then finally, I think I think it's useful for you to know um, how we performed the biopsy. You know, did we use a spring-loaded device? Did we use a vacuum-assisted device? Or did we perform an FNA? Um, you know, for, for example, uh, you know, let's say I see suspicious calcifications on a mammogram and we go on to biopsy those calcifications with vacuum assistance and get good samples, send calcifications. And in our impression, you know, we say high suspicion calcifications, suspect DCIS, and you see DCIS, I mean, that's a slam dunk, right? That's easy, probably don't need a comment. <laughs> Absolutely, where those where those things all, all align. Um, right. So I guess in the impression that's going to be in the report, right? Like you're saying mass, calcs, architecture. And you said also that level of suspicion. How how should we uh, interpret or receive that level of suspicion? Like, is it is that kind of a, a binary, or should we really try to see that as a as a, a shade of gray? I'm kind of thinking about in our world of uh, like uh, cytology. Um, you know, there is kind of specific words that are used in this kind of shade of of gray. And uh, how should we kind of interpret that? Sure, sure. Well, usually when I send a clinical impression, I'll indicate high, intermediate, or low mm -hmm. suspicion, and then whatever it is that I'm sampling. And and so I try to I try to make it a little bit black and white. Um, I don't give high or low. I just high, intermediate, or low. Um, if I'm pretty confident this is going to be DCIS, for example, and um, and I say high suspicion calcifications, and you you report back fibrocystic changes, then you and I need to have a phone conversation probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I try to I try to make it a little bit black and white um, for you guys as well. Oh, that's helpful. And can you elaborate a little bit on, you, you mentioned that modality is for what type of imaging is used and how that might be helpful for the pathologist to understand. Can you kind of elaborate on uh, what you mean by that? Because as an outsider, uh, I'm not sure if I'm really kind of picking up um, what you're talking about. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, the common modalities that we use are mammograms, ultrasound, and MRI. Those are probably the top three. And so if we're biopsying uh, something with mammogram guidance, and so that would be something like a stereotactic breast biopsy or a tomosynthesis guided breast biopsy, you know, you're we're we're usually aiming at something that could be DCIS or not. Um, could it be invasive or microinvasive? Absolutely, but but when we're doing a, a stereotactic biopsy, we're thinking about DCIS the most. Whereas if we're using ultrasound or MRI guidance, we're probably targeting a mass, and so that could be invasive malignancy or any of the benign masses that 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 can be diagnosed in the breast. And so that's sort of that's sort of what I mean by um, useful to know kind of the modality. Ah, uh, no, that, that's very helpful. Uh, you know, we've been kind of uh, playing around with this idea of kind of this interprofessional collaboration. Like you said, in certain situations, you know, we need to have a phone call and, and talk things out. Um, you know, knowing that the the audience here, we have a lot of uh, pathologists and and lab medicine folks that are listening to this, and, and students along the pathway of hopefully playing this this team sport of medicine. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on how pathologists could better collaborate with radiologists? And I, I really ask this question because sometimes it's hard to know how do I get started collaborating with an outside group. And so, you know, your insights here are really appreciated. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, first and foremost, I really do think our collaboration efforts are are fantastic, and particularly in the clinical arena. Um, we really are the only subspecialty that works with the breast pathologist that perform concordance reporting on our biopsy samples. I don't think anybody else does that. Um, and so I, I think that our collaboration uh, between our groups really, really facilitates this, uh, the ability to do that. Um, otherwise, you know, as you mentioned on the clinical side, I think phone conversations are always helpful. Um, if you guys are con confused about the material that we send, certainly happy to take a conversation um, or if we can provide any additional, you know, information about what you might be seeing in a challenging case, happy, happy to discuss it at any time. Um, you know, in addition, we're, we're starting our radiology patho pathology concordance conference back up. Um, this is a conference that we run each week. Um, our fellows run it. And we like to get as many people there as possible from the multidisciplinary team, but particularly radiologists and pathologists so to sort of discuss some of the more challenging cases that we biopsied maybe the week previous. Um, COVID really kind of hit that conference hard and we sort of, it just sort of went away for about three years, but, but our current fellows are really excited to start it back up and we're, we're starting to do those conferences again. Um, I, I still remember you know, some very, very eager pathology fellows that came to those conferences. I, they even bring PowerPoints with slides about, you know, the the biopsy findings. And it was really, really useful. Um, that was maybe four or five years ago. But, um, you know, that, that conference was really beneficial to our trainees and I think to your trainees as well. And we'd love, we'd love for you guys to, to come to those conferences again. And I'm, I'm happy to try to facilitate that. Yeah, that's fantastic. It, it, great for our audience uh, to hear, right? Because we have a lot of audience outside of Mayo, and they might be kind of thinking about how how is this kind of play out in their own area. Some may have these conferences that are going, or some might have uh, some like ours where uh, COVID kind of uh, gave us a little bit of a, a pause and a skip. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, there's a lot, because we have our, our student listeners, I'd be curious to kind of just hear your thoughts on, you know, how for these kind of interprofessional conferences, right? That's that's where, it, like, I think you're highlighting some important learning is happening for how your radiology trainees are interacting with pathology trainees, pathology consultants. Um, are there, are there any thoughts you've had over the years for either, you know, how do you kind of prepare people for going into these environments or are there kind of some common feedbacks that you've given to trainees over the years to uh, learn the most from these sorts of uh, collaborations? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of good um, kind of on the fly discussion at these meetings that, that can be beneficial. Um, to, to teach um, the interdisciplinary team about the other's fields. Um, you know, ideally we would have breast pathology uh, fellows rotate with us um, to visit our procedural practice as well. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's happening right now. I think it has happened in the past. We, we do send our fellows to you mm -hmm. and um, they're very, very complimentary of those weeks just to see you know, see what they biopsied under the microscope and, and how that compares to, you know, all of the other breast pathologies out there. So mm -hmm. um, rotating, I think, in the other subspecialty is really helpful. Yeah, I think that's been wonderful as I've, you know, talking with our trainees over the years, this idea that they understand kind of the workflow with the other group so they can understand where sometimes various pressures come up and certainly goes a long way for, you know, if, if you and I have, have met in, in real life and uh, shared a laugh or whatnot, like it, it makes it easier to pick up the phone and have those, those critical conversations. Yeah. I also think it's really, really useful. I mean, if there's an interesting case that, that they can, you know, write up very quickly. I mean, case reports can happen pretty fast. And, you know, if you have a collaborative team on that between two fellows or two residents, I think those are fantastic opportunities. Oh, uh, 
absolutely. And, you know, I'm grateful that you're highlighting how what might be originally perceived as maybe a clinical uh, practice arena thing, a clinical domain, how it's filling roles in both education as well as the research shield. Um, I, I think uh, that's a true statement. Uh, can I maybe close with just kind of asking you, you know, how might breast imaging change in the in the coming years? I think a lot of our audience aren't necessarily, uh, you know, don't don't have your vantage point and perspectives and, and curious uh, what you see in the coming years for breast imaging. Sure, sure. I um I think it's an exciting time, to be honest. Um, I, I think that there could be some changes in how screening is performed. Um you know, right now, everybody gets an annual mammogram um, starting at age 40 and, you know, going into their 80s and 90s. Um, and every year they have to attend that mammogram. And, you know, we detect a lot of, of tiny cancers on those mammograms now. In the future, um, and people are working on this right now, but I think that there may be opportunities for blood tests um, as initial screening tools. Um, patients would get their annual blood test. Um, those that are negative would be done for the rest of the year until their next annual test. Those that are positive would end up coming to us to, to get diagnostic imaging rather than a screening uh, mammogram. Um, the other thing I think could be exciting is that um, there are a lot of developments in MRI right now. And um, Abbreviated MRI might be the future of screening as well. Um, it's much more sensitive and specific than mammography is. The trouble with with MRI really is that the machines cost a lot. You know that the exams take a long time to perform. Um, patients need to have an IV placed with contrast, and so if we can get by some of those things and make the examination shorter to perform, I think that's I think it has potential for sure. Um, I think AI will be a, a factor in helping us provide diagnoses in the future. Um, we're still working to try to figure out the best way to incorporate AI into our practice. You're probably doing the same thing. Um, I really hope that imaging specificity will improve, um, which you know would decrease really the need for biopsies in many cases. Um, I've thought that this would happen for years, and so far it hasn't happened. We do as many biopsies now as we have. 10 years ago when, when I started on staff. Um, a couple other things. I think, I think image-guided uh, percutaneous therapies like cryoablation um, has potential to reduce uh, open surgical treatment. Um, I think that has a, a future. Um, but, you know, having said, having said all that, I, I, I do think that um, image-guided biopsies are not going away anytime soon. And so you and I will have many years of collaboration ahead of us, I think. I'm really looking forward to that. And I really appreciate, it's really quite an extensive list you're you're sharing with our listeners, which I, I'm sure for that there's at least something that's kind of planted in uh, every listener's mind uh, in that list that you mentioned. We've been rounding with Dr. Fazio talking about fundamentals of breast imaging and what pathologists need to know. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Fazio. Absolutely. Dr. Carter, thanks so much for the invitation. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email to mcleducation at mayo.edu. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through educational conversations. Mm -hmm.